On this edition of SciTech Now, discover how genetic engineering is saving the American chestnut tree from a threat to its survival. The American chestnut is actually a, a classic example of what happens when you introduce a pathogen uh, from another country and it came across when we brought, start bringing Asian chestnut trees to this country. Then go behind the scenes as environmentalists work to ensure a precious resource is around for the next generation. PBS NewsHour weekend anchor and SciTech Now contributor Hari Srinivasan discusses the future of driverless cars and find out how technology is bringing museums into the digital age. Coming up next on SciTech Now. Hello, I'm Simon Perez and welcome to SciTech Now, our weekly program bringing you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and innovation here in central New York and across the country. Let's begin with the American chestnut tree. The American chestnut was once a staple of the northeastern United States. You can find songs and streets named after the tree all over the place. But where have they gone? In the early 20th century, an Asian bark fungus was accidentally introduced to America, and when infected, the chestnut tree was highly susceptible to chestnut blight. Since the early 1900s, more than 3 billion chestnut trees were wiped out. Fast forward to 2015, a pair of professors at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry has a plan to stop the blight in its tracks. Charles Maynard and William Powell believe they have created a new strain of blight-resistant American chestnuts through genetic engineering. American chestnut used to be uh, the most common tree in the eastern forest, representing about 25% of standing timber. It was uh, a keystone species, very important to wildlife. Once the uh, blight went through, uh, large populations of wildlife also declined. Um, it's also part of our American heritage. I mean, you can't go into a city without seeing a chestnut street. Uh, this time of year, you hear chestnuts roasting on the open fire. They're talking about American chestnuts. Uh, it's really part of, of our uh, American heritage, so I think it's very, very important. The American chestnut is actually a, a classic example of what happens when you introduce a pathogen uh, from another country into the United States. Uh, it was introduced from Asia about 100 years ago and it came across when we brought, started bringing Asian chestnut trees to this country. And those trees are resistant to blight, but our trees were not. So they jumped off those trees onto our trees and caused uh, great devastation. Our trees are fully susceptible. Um, it, it was introduced here uh, in New York and it spread all the way down to Georgia in about 50 years, killing somewhere between three to five billion American chestnut trees. You know, genetic engineering actually started back in the 1970s. Uh, at that time, they were mostly working with bacteria uh, then in the 1980s, they started working with uh, agrobacterium, and by the 1990s, uh, we had some of our first transgenic plants going on the market. And so we just kind of looked at those type of techniques and said, can we apply those techniques to American chestnut? It only took us 25 years, but uh, we have now uh, successfully made a blight-resistant American chestnut tree. This is our uh, leaf assay, and it's an early test where we can predict how uh, blight-resistant the trees will be. Now, this isn't the only test we do. We do a small stem assay later and then eventually do tests in the field. But this is the first test that really tells us if we have blight resistance. Best case scenario, then uh, people will be able to use these tools to uh, help other trees that are threatened. A lot of these techniques could be applied to other trees, as well as just going through like the regulatory process. Um, you know, making headway through that will make it easier for other trees to go through that same process in the future. Now, American chestnut is not a, um, a petunia or a tobacco plant or something like that. It's much more hard, much more difficult to uh, work with. Uh, so it took us a long time just to work out the techniques, mainly in, in Chuck's lab, of how to take uh, a single cell of the chestnut tree, get a gene in it, and then regenerate one of these whole plants. The simplest way is uh, to, to, to do transformation is with leaf pieces, where you take a piece of leaf and uh, sterilize it, and then uh, the, if, it's, if you can get it to produce shoots around the edges of, the, of where it's wounded, it will, it's, it's very simple, that's the that's a easiest technique. We had to use uh, a, what are called somatic embryos. And what you have to do is you have to collect a, a chestnut, an immature chestnut before it's ripe, take it out of the shell and establish it in tissue culture. I've been on the project for quite a long time and when I first started, we were able to transform uh, American chestnut callus 
barely. It was very hard. We were excited when we got one transformed event. Um, now, Dr. Powell or Dr. Maynard come up to me and say, okay, I want 10 events of, with this gene in it. Can you do it? And I can say, I can give you 40. So it's like, boom, we can do it now. And those are, uh, those are much easier to, uh, tr they're easier to transform because every single cell on the surface of the, um, of the surface of the embryo can make another embryo. So what we have here is the uh, high humidity growth chambers and we need these to go from the tissue culture lab into the um, greenhouse. So this is the intermediate step where we acclimatize the plants, okay? So in here, and you can kind of see the uh, steam rolling out a little bit. Um, these things are above 95% humidity, but even that, that's not quite high enough. So some of the plants we start off in actually these tubs that will get us up to 100% humidity. We grow them in here for a little while and then get them into, uh, or get them out of those tubs. So they finally get to be little plantlets like this. Again, still in the high humidity. And from there, um, we will move to the other growth chamber which has lower humidity. And so over about a uh, six week period, we go from about 100% humidity down to normal uh, humidity in, uh, at room temperature. So after they come out of the high humidity growth chamber, we go up into this lower humidity growth chamber. It's still very humid and they keep on growing. So they get bigger about this size and when they get about this size, then we can take them out into the greenhouse. If you notice these plants here, they're all staked up. And the reason why is because these plants all came from tissue culture. And in order to get them to grow straight, we have to stake them to kind of train them to grow straight. But the neat thing about this particular plant is that it's starting to flower very early. Uh, this is only six months old and it's forming what's called uh, catkins. These are the male flowers of the uh, chestnut tree. And what we can do with this, when we get these early flowering trees, we can collect that pollen and then outcross it to some of the wild type mother trees that we have out in the field and actually produce nuts. And these nuts um, will grow then like a normal American chestnut tree. Uh, it will grow nice and straight. It will grow much taller than this much quicker because it has that large nut uh, available with it. My grandparents once could walk into a chestnut forest. My generation does not have that advantage, but my grandchildren, they were gonna be like my grandparents and they're gonna have that same advantage of having the chestnut tree back. Charles and William hope to grow 10,000 blight-resistant trees over the next five years. Then they'll be planted, first in New York and later in other parts of the country. Fresh water is such a valuable resource, people often fight for access to it. In this excerpt from the documentary Chattahoochee, From Water War to Water Vision, we take a look at how communities in Georgia are cooperating to secure the future of the river. It's late June in Seminole County, tucked away in the southwest corner of Georgia. 50 migrant workers from Mexico swarm on and around a large piece of machinery, part tractor, part conveyor. On the ground, pickers strip off ears of sweet corn. Others stand on wings, sprouting from each side, packing the corn into crates. This carefully choreographed ballet of man and machinery aims to bring food to market in time for a key holiday. We're fortunate in this area that the best growing season corresponds with the best marketing season, which is right before July 4. For the last two weeks of June, we grow all the sweet corn for the eastern half of the country. What we're trying to do is get the insecticide down to get the uh, worms that's down behind the ear. Besides insecticide, what Glenn Hurd and his fellow farmers need to make a good crop is water. Lots of it. Inch of water on an acre of land is about 27,000 gallons. When you multiply 27,000 gallons times 20 times thousands of acres, this is a lot of water.
Over the 60-day growing season, Glen Hurd's 1,000 acres of sweet corn will consume over 400 million gallons, more than half the water Metro Atlanta residents use in a day. So where does all this water come from? The Flint River is one source, but an even larger river flows underground. Occasionally, in places like Radium Springs, south of Albany, this immense pool of groundwater wells up to the surface, tinged blue by dissolved minerals. This water comes from the Floridan Aquifer, a layer of porous limestone under South Georgia and Florida that soaks up rainwater like a giant sponge. There's a lot of water. It's a it's a very large aquifer system that's probably one of the most prolific aquifers in the U.S. To tap that rich supply of water for thirsty crops, farmers have resorted to irrigation on a grand scale. It's called center pivot. Water pumped from a central well at a rate of 1,500 gallons a minute flows outward inside a metal pipe. This long pipe, sometimes carried over nine or 10 spans, slowly pivots or walks its wheels in a giant circle as it sprays water on the crop. During dry summers in the lower Flint Basin, over 6,000 center pivot units can pour as much as half a billion gallons a day onto valuable cash crops like cotton, peanuts, and pecans. But that productivity may come at a price, especially in times of drought. If we think about our water supply, both in our streams and our aquifers, as a bank account, we're putting a fixed amount into the bank account, and then all of a sudden we start taking more money out of the bank account without adding more money in. And it's bound to have an effect. To head off the threat of pumping restrictions, as well as rising energy costs, farmers are devising new ways to make water go further. Drop nozzles apply the water directly to the crops. An end gun shutoff can prevent water being wasted on roads. But new technology can apply water to fields even more precisely. Steve Singletary is one of 20 farmers pioneering the technique. He inserts a computer disk into a center pivot control panel. It contains a customized watering program specially designed for this field. In the future, he'll be able to start the program remotely from his computer back in the office. It's called variable rate irrigation. So if you get a sandy place in the field, you put out water faster because it'll absorb it faster. If you get in a hard red place to keep the water from running off and washing in the field and losing the water, you put it out at a slower rate. With the help of this system, Steve is growing a better crop using less water. Others, like Glenn Hurd, are starting to adopt the technology. We know that we need this water to keep going on and on and on. I mean, we want to be productive. Uh, for generations to come. It was Mark Twain who supposedly said, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. And apparently he was right. For a detailed timeline on this battle over water, visit our website. In today's digitally driven world, it's nearly impossible to disconnect from technology. Traditionally, spaces like museums or parks have been respites from the pressure to click, tap, or swipe. But one company is hoping to change all that, using technology to engage audiences and encourage interaction. Here's a look. There's a lot of interest in leveraging new technologies within museums. Museums are both about knowledge and about storytelling. And those are things that technology can really help with if utilized correctly. Local Projects is a design and strategy firm working at the intersection of media and architecture. So we develop everything from iPhone applications and huge multi-projector installations in tandem with physical spaces. I think museums are understanding that people want to be involved, they want to participate. 
So what we're interested in doing is creating experiences. One thing that really brought a lot of attention to our studio is a project called Gallery One at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And it was really the first time that we could think about all of these new technologies and applying them to such a prestigious institution. One of the craziest ideas we've ever had is to use facial recognition to connect you with an artwork. So as you make different facial gestures, it actually brings up an artwork with the same facial expression that you can then email to yourself and go visit inside of the museum. So it's a way to engage and participate within this incredible array of the history of global art, but in a way that you find meaningful and also shareable. We've worked on the 9-11 Memorial Museum for a little over eight years now. We have a broad array of different types of experiences, whether there are audio alcoves that allow you to hear oral histories from inside the towers, sharing what people experienced on that day as they ran to safety. And we saw the second plane crash. All of a sudden, I thought we were watching like a replay of it. And we frankly had a very, very radical approach to the museum from the beginning. We didn't want to just make a stagnant, static museum that would tell a story from the beginning to the end uh, that felt finished, both because uh, of the event and the fact that the story itself isn't finished, that it's still ongoing, that we're somewhere in between current events and history, but also because everyone going through that museum has their own 9-11 story. You want to extend people's senses and satisfy people's curiosities. And that's something that new technology is really, really well connected for. A lot of museums are really looking to people's phones as the connective answer, meaning they say, well, people are already on their phones and they're collecting things with their phone, they're taking pictures in a museum, we should just put all the information on the phone as well. And from the beginning, I think very wisely, the Cooper Hewitt really were thinking, you know, this is the, the National Design Museum, we need to think bigger, not just about reinventing the Cooper Hewitt, but also the museum process in general. So within the Cooper Hewitt, we have uh, a number of different interfaces, and one of the key interfaces we call the collections table. This is what the table looks like when you first walk up. This is called the river, and it's essentially a series of different objects from the collection. So you can grab and look at all of these different pieces, one by one, and you can search by color, you can search by different tags, and you can essentially make your way object by object to understand the connections between all these different designed objects. The other thing you can do is just draw. And when you do that, it brings forward different objects from the collection. The other thing that you can do is jump right from there into an object that you yourself have designed. So it's basically a piece of software that even as it's open and you can create anything you want, it has a history to it. And it's trying to teach and inform you and try and really shape you as a designer. The Immersion Room is really a special installation. It's almost the heart in some ways of the new Cooper Hewitt because it allows a complete visual change and immersion within a variety of different designs. Now the Cooper Hewitt has this incredible world-class wallpaper collection, but because it's wallpaper, they only show it a little square at a time. This is for the first time you can be in a room and actually see a full installation of wallpaper, or if you're inclined, you can design your own wallpaper and be surrounded by it within that space. So the key is it's how you use technology. You need to use it wisely and you need to use it so that it engages people further and makes deeper connections with the collection. You know, museums, like all institutions, are just seeking relevance. They want to be engaged. They want to be meaningful. That is the brass ring for all institutions. And so if we can make things that excite people, that, that get their imagination going, and that help them to share those things, that's an amazing win. The Smithsonian Design Museum is the latest to join the digital age. It has interactive tables that help visitors learn more about being a designer. On those days when we're stuck in rush hour traffic, who doesn't dream about letting someone else do the driving? Well, what about something else? PBS NewsHour weekend anchor and SciTech Now contributor Hari Srinivasan sat down with CNET editor-at-large Tim Stevens to talk about driverless cars. 
You've actually been in a car that is just driving by itself. It was you went off to Sweden to do it, right? But it works, right? Uh, Sweden's got a, uh, a pilot program with Volvo, of course, being kind of the national car company there. Uh, and they've got uh, some highways set up in the town of Gothenburg, which is just outside of Volvo HQ, where you can basically go on the ring roads around the city, push a button on the dashboard, and the car takes over for itself. It'll slow down if there's any obstacles or traffic ahead of it, and it can even communicate with the city using wireless communication to know if there are lane closures or any other delays that it needs to make amends for, basically. And this is just really their prototype. They say that this is their first step. They don't have a fleet of these running yet. Right. But eventually, they want to start selling cars that will do more and more of the driving for you. Right, and Volvo says by 2017, they'll be selling these cars. And the interesting thing about Volvo's approach is that they're building this technology on sensors that are already in the cars today. We're seeing a lot of self-driving research out there from Google and from Mercedes and from Audi and a lot of other companies, too. But a lot of those companies are really being built on a lot of sensors being built into the car. You see laser scanners on the roof and radar and all sorts of stuff that adds a lot of cost to the car. Volvo's technology is really simple, really cheap, and they think that they can basically build on top of that and just add a lot of smarts to the existing systems and do it for very inexpensively. And, and I think mostly the concern for a lot of people is, what about the safety? We've got so many sensors on there. What if I'm in a bad hailstorm? electrical whatever, all this stuff fries out, am I going to get into a wreck because the car can't compute? Right, and that's a big part of the equation is how can the car hand control back to the driver at this point? This is a very important thing because the cars absolutely cannot drive themselves in every condition. In fact, Google's car has never seen rain, it's never seen snow. Uh, it's only been tested in perfect California conditions. That's one of the big challenges is seeing through snow, seeing through rain, and knowing how to react it. So a lot of these car companies are researching ways to make sure that the driver is paying attention. So if the car does get into one of those situations, you can make sure the driver is looking at the road and then hand control back to the driver in a safe way, or if not, pull off to the side of the road and stop slowly. Okay, so let's say, best case scenario, we've sorted out the safety. What are some of the societal impacts here if we have a lane full of cars driving an inch apart from each other, in other words, it's 70 miles an hour, and people are able to, you know, have their coffee or read their paper? So you can definitely imagine special lanes on, on the highway that have steeper off-ramps because you don't have to worry about stoplights and that kind of thing. You can envision traffic lights eventually going away someday because cars could just space themselves out appropriately and they could just crisscross all together. You can imagine parking garages that are a lot uh, tighter in terms of height because nobody needs to get out of the cars and they can be a lot tighter in terms of parking distance because you don't need to open the doors because basically the car will pull up, drop you off where you want to go, you'll hit a button on your phone and the car will go park itself. So the car can go up and find a spot in a parking garage garage and basically just pack the cars themselves in so that if one car needs to get out on the other side, the other cars could just move out of the way, let that in, and then pack in again. So we can fit a lot more cars in the same spaces without having to build more garages and more highways. And then maybe we wouldn't necessarily all need to own one vehicle. The vehicle could go out and service all the other people around while it's not driving for us, right? That's the ultimate vision that a lot of people have, and ultimately I think that's what Google's really looking forward to, especially with their work with Uber. Um, basically, the idea is that once you're really just using a car to get from point A to point B, when you're saying at your phone, I need to go to work at this time, it doesn't matter if that car was sitting in your driveway all night long, just being idle. If as long as the car's there in time to get you to work on time, who cares where it was that night before? Who cares where it is while you're at work? Uh, the, the idea of car ownership may be something of the past as these cars can, can basically drive themselves. Okay, so before we decide to shed our vehicles and get into this leasing agreement with this vehicle that's <laughs> running around, in the intermediate term, there are kind of operating systems that are now working their way into our cars. I mean, right. we saw a little bit of it with the Ford Sync, but there's also Apple's getting into it, Google Android's getting into it. As a driver, I'm saying, do I need more things to distract someone while they're driving? Ultimately, smartphones are very distracting, and people are unfortunately showing that they would rather be connected and use their phones while driving than be safe. Uh, study after study shows that using your phone while you're driving is as dangerous as driving drunk, but yet people are still texting while driving. They're still, you know, pulling up a Spotify playlist or something like that, which is, which is unsafe. These systems are designed to make it much more easy to do that, so a lot of them are really heavily voice-oriented, so you can speak to your phone and say, give me directions to this place, or have a text message read to you rather than having to try to see it on a screen. Uh, and that's basically the idea of Apple's CarPlay and Google's Android Auto and some of the other solutions that are coming out to give you some of the control over your smartphone without having to look at the screen, without having to try to type on a tiny little screen, and without being distracted. So if you are driving and trying to interact with your phone, you can do it in a safe way. You know, a lot of the in-car navigation systems in the past 10 years, they actually added a layer of distraction to drivers right. where they would sit around and try to navigate a tiny mouse wheel here or there and try to pinpoint where they want to go. And I'm like, the whole time, hey, buddy, you're driving this 
huge 3,000 pound right. machine on the road, right? And part of that was because the voice recognition in those systems was so primitive because it had to be built into the car. Every word that you had to say had to be into the car. Whereas now with our phones, basically, if you ever talk to Siri, if you're talking to Google, the phone isn't actually processing what you say. It's all going up to the cloud and then they figure it out on some powerful server somewhere. When you add that kind of functionality to the car, you can do a lot more comprehensive things with your voice. And once you can say, give me directions to a really long address or send a text message to my mom saying, hey, I'll be late for dinner, uh, and the phone can figure that out for you, suddenly things get a lot easier and a lot less distracting. All right, Tim Stevens of CNET, thanks so much. Thank you. Experts predict over the next 20 years, consumers will buy 100 million driverless cars a year. That'll be three quarters of all the cars sold. That's it for this edition of SciTech Now. For more information on science, technology, and innovation, visit our website at wcny.org slash SciTechNow. And you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. Next week on SciTech Now, find out how one professor is putting science on a collision course with art. We explore the place on Earth with its sights on Mars. Learn how an unusual creature may save our shorelines. Discover how 3D printing is reshaping the engineering landscape. And we investigate the future of the digital age. I'm Simon Perez. We'll see you next week on SciTech Now.